Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Visiting Speaker Series, our guest today, who I'm really, really excited about, I've been waiting for this talk all fall, is Susan Clancy. Uh, she's a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard uh, studying psychology, um, and she's currently living down in Managua, in Nicaragua, doing work with the Central American Institute for Business Administration. Um, I think this is just a fascinating topic and a fascinating book. Uh, she's done extensive research on memory and traumatic events. Um, and this sort of popular book is an offshoot of that work that she's done. So, without further ado, please help me welcome Susan Clancy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, oh, good. Okay. So you can hear me all right? Yep. My voice tends to be kind of loud and annoying even without the microphone, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm here to talk about my book, Abducted, uh, why people come to believe they were kidnapped by space aliens. And I just want to say, uh, well, the book's based on six years of research, uh, interviewing, among other people, uh, many who believe they were abducted by aliens. And I want to say a few things up front, just to get it out of the way. And the uh, first thing is, no, I have not been abducted. That's the first thing. Many people want to know if that's what I believe. The second thing is, I don't believe anybody else has been abducted either. Uh, I'm sorry if that upsets anybody in the audience. Uh, and the third thing is, what's particularly interesting is I was not even interested in aliens or UFOs when I began this course of research. So I often get asked, if you don't believe in alien abductions, and you're not interested in alien abductions, why did you spend half a decade doing work on this at Harvard University? <coughs> and I think that's an excellent question. Um, I should say I did not begin to do work with aliens. I actually was doing work on memory distortion and false memory creation at Harvard University with Dan Schachter, who may have yeah. spoke here, yeah. the seven sins of memory guy. And we were trying to understand more about how and why people can develop false memories. And at the time, there was a big controversy over recovered memories of sexual abuse. So this was in the 90s. And all over the country, people were going into therapy and developing sometimes very vivid, traumatic, horrific memories of sexual abuse, of satanic ritual abuse, of just horrible, horrible things. And many psychotherapists believed that these memories were in fact real. That the way the mind works is when something traumatic happens to you, you banish it into your unconscious. That it's a defense mechanism of the mind, serves to protect you from these painful memories, but that these memories, once banished into the unconscious, can remain in their dormant state perfectly preserved until they're uncovered with the help of a therapist years later. And many therapists believe that the only way to cure psychologically depressed people who had abuse histories was to recover these memories in therapy to really deal with the traumatic events that happened and then the, then the subject or the patient would be psychologically healed. So that was one side of the argument. Repression exists, you need to recover memories for psychological health. The other side of the argument, very popular at Harvard in the 90s, was that repression doesn't exist. If traumatic events actually happened, they would always be remembered, uh, usually remembered all too well. And furthermore, that what was actually happening is that these were false memories. They were uh, created in the therapy sessions by therapists who were committed to recovering these memories. So essentially, you have, are they real memories that are repressed, or are they false memories created in therapy? 
So this debate was very volatile. It raged on. And what I thought was weird as a graduate student was nobody had done any memory research on the group that was at the center of the controversy, the people who were recovering memories of traumatic events in therapy. So I said, I think it would be very interesting to bring them into the lab and to study their memory functioning in the lab using standard laboratory paradigms to try and figure out if these guys were particularly prone to creating false memories. Because I thought if they're prone to creating false memories in the lab, maybe they're prone to creating false memories outside of the lab, and then that would give support to the false memory hypothesis. Okay, suffice it to say, this was a very politically incorrect topic to pursue. I went into Harvard thinking that science was open-minded and that what people care about is the truth. And that's what's important. And if you use standardized laboratory techniques, if you submit your data to the peer review process, if it gets published in the scientific journals, that you're in the clear, that that's legitimate. I learned very quickly that there are many topics that you're just not supposed to touch. And sexual abuse, questioning the reality of sexual abuse in any way, is inflammatory for many people. And I started receiving hate mail, protests in the departments. I had academic talks that were boycotted. I had my first child in 1999 and was called in the New York Times a friend of pedophiles everywhere. So I said, I can't study false memory creation anymore in sexual abuse victims. It's too politically charged. and. There's no way to corroborate whether the abuse actually happened. Ultimately, I could say it's a false memory, but I don't know. There's no way to know for sure if these horrific abuse events happened or not. So I'm going to change areas. I'm going to go into a safe area. <laughs> I'm going to study a group of people for whom I know the event did not happen. <laughs> Alien abductees. I thought it was the greatest idea ever. Who's going to challenge that? Uh, these people are, <laughs> these people are uh, clearly, well, they believe them. Many people do believe it, and they have vivid memories, oftentimes of what happened, traumatic memories. And I wanted to bring them into the lab, interview them, and learn more about how and why people come to develop these false beliefs and false memories. Um, I have to just say up front, I was very naive. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who believe in abductions and they believe in aliens and they are very angry. And in contrast to the sexual abuse area, it's mostly men that are angry enough to email me and send letters. Now I live in Nicaragua. I can't even send myself a letter in Nicaragua, and I receive <laughs> mail regularly. Like, I'm on a little side street. It's like Catatata Sur, which is the highway, kilometer 10 and 3 fourths, yellow house on the left. And I'm getting mail there from people who are furious. Um, so this has not been any less controversial for me. Uh, so suffice it to say, I think I just have to leave this whole area in general because I don't think I have the thick skin required to challenge people's belief systems. But anyway, okay, I didn't know that in 1999. So it's 1999, I want to study alien abductions, what do I do? So I run an ad in the paper and the ad says, have you been abducted by aliens? <laughs> It just so funny. it's made so much sense to me then. <laughs> and now I was thinking, what the hell was I thinking? First of all, the person at the, you know, you have to sell the ad. And people are desperate for ad space in the Boston newspapers. I mean, they're practically giving it to you for free. And I couldn't get this woman to accept it. Because she kept saying, you must be joking. This isn't legitimate. She needed a confirmation from Harvard that it was real. Anyway, they ran the ad. The phone rang off the hook for one month based on one ad. And I had recruited subject populations for 15 years. Like I was working with depressed patients, alcoholics, you name it. I never received a response like this. Uh, unfortunately, most of the calls were not actually from alien abductees. Uh, there were a lot of calls from people from the local community who were pissed off. Doesn't Harvard have anything better to do with their research money? Um, there were calls from people playing jokes on each other. Like, this is Bob from Boston Volkswagen. I've been abducted. I need to talk about it. Please give me a call. And then I call Bob, and Bob has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> the worst were, I didn't speak Spanish back then, but the worst were the number of calls from 
Latin Americans who didn't speak English very well who misunderstood the ad and thought I was looking for people who were abducted by U.S. immigration <laughs> services at the border. And it was so hard on the phone in my pathetic Spanish trying to explain that I was not interested in their very real problems. I was actually studying, what was it, hombres de estrella. I was like, spacemen. And it, it was just terrible. Uh, they called. Then a few aliens called. Uh, the first, I think it was the first night we checked the messages, I went in just to check if anyone had called and I thought we'd get two calls and there were like 127. And then I'm going through them and then it was nighttime and it was dark and stormy in Boston. The weather's a lot like Seattle. It's kind of dark all the time and raining. And the scariest call came in. It was like this hissing in the background and this kind of static and then this like weird atonal beeping. But it had kind of this like cadence to it. Anyway, it was an alien. He called back two or three times. Um, <laughs> we and we had a lot of newspapers and magazines that wanted to know why Harvard was researching this. But I did get people who were willing to talk about their abduction experiences. And I have to say the first subject I ever met with completely uh, changed my view about what this population was going to look like. I have to admit I expected that these would be kind of weird people, probably a lot of single guys. I don't know if there are a lot of single guys here, so I shouldn't say anything. All right, but I, I expected kind of, I don't know what to say. Anyway, I expected them to be weird. But the guy that showed up in my office, I mean, I describe him in the book, and my husband's pissed off because he said, you shouldn't have done that. But I mean, he was really good looking. And married, had kids, very successfully employed. Uh, a wonderful guy. He was able to talk about his abduction experiences with skepticism and humor. He understood how strange it was, but deep down he believed that what happened to him was real and that this was the best expl explanation for it. Um, so he sort of shook up my conceptions about what these people were going to be like, and I'm glad because in the end, contrary to what many people believe, they're not crazy. They were very nice. They were a heterogeneous group ranging from doctors at Harvard Medical School to MIT graduate students to single moms to construction workers in Boston. Uh, I want to stress again, we did research on psychiatric disorder in this group and it confirmed a number of other studies that showed that they're not more likely than others to experience psychological disorders. Um, they're normal and they were very nice and I learned a lot from my work with them that's in the book. Uh, there were a few tough experiences um, a couple of the guys were psychotic um, and it had to be shipped off to various hospitals once they hit my office. Uh, one guy kept screaming about how Britney Spears was an alien in his head. Um, another guy wanted to reenact the sexual experience he had with his sylph-like alien. Apparently she was on his lap and he needed to show me what happened with him. And I, <laughs> so there were a couple of weird ones. But these people were surprisingly normal and sane. Um, so what what did I learn? I mean, what can you take away from these guys? The main thing I learned is that a lot of us, perhaps most of us, are looking for explanations for things that have happened to us in our lives and for, in their, our lives and for psychological distress or anomalous experiences. So what normally, ha like nobody goes to bed and wakes up screaming, holy God, I've been abducted by aliens. It doesn't happen that way. What happens is people have some experiences or symptoms, they're trying to understand it, and they wonder, I wonder, could this be aliens? And what are these symptoms? Often, it starts out with an episode of sleep paralysis. Have any of you ever had sleep paralysis? Yeah. Scary, wasn't it? Scary? Scary. I had an episode of sleep paralysis. I had just written a paper on it. And in my episode, I'm levitating. I'm like spinning like a rotisserie chicken. And I know it's sleep paralysis, but I'm still thinking, now I know what my subjects were talking about because it's that powerful. What it is essentially is it's a non-pathological desynchrony in sleep cycles. So for a moment, you're, you wake up, but your body is still experiencing the paralysis that normally accompanies sleep. So you can't move, but your mind is awake. So you're aware you can't move. And it's a frightening experience when it happens. 
And often, in about 50% of sufferers of sleep paralysis, this experience is accompanied by what they call hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations. So while you're awake and paralyzed, you're also seeing things like shadows in the room, people often report, or you're hearing things like whispers or perhaps uh, like electricity or static, people often report. Sometimes they report the sounds of footsteps coming upstairs. And often it's accompanied by tactile hallucinations too. So people feel like they're levitating above the bed, they're spinning, or they're flying through air. This experience affects probably about 30% of the population at some point in their life. Usually happens when your sleep cycles are changed, like if you have jet lag or for new moms or people trying to finish their PhDs or something like that. For you guys, I'm sure you keep all kinds of unusual hours, so you might be more prone to this. Um, it only lasts about 30 seconds to a minute, but that does not stop it from being absolutely terrifying for many people. Not everybody. Some people have sleep paralysis and they say, that was pretty weird, and they forget about it. Some people have sleep paralysis and they think, I need to know what happened to me. Other experiences that people have are episodes of depression or anxiety or sexual problems. I often had subjects say, I've spent my whole life feeling different from other people, like I'm on the outside looking in. Or I feel like the world, everybody's connected to each other, and I don't know, I just feel different like I'm alone. I mean, it's things like that. So the experiences can range from a strange pattern of moles on the back to years of depression or anxiety to maybe a sleep paralysis episode or even <coughs> 10 of them. And people look for explanation. That doesn't make you weird. Most of the world is looking for explanation for why they feel the way they do. And if you don't believe me, just go to Barnes and Nobles and go to the self-help section or the psychology section of the bookstore. There are thousands of books helping you understand why you feel the way you don't want to. It could be adult attention deficit disorder, undiagnosed, post-traumatic stress disorder, not enough yoga, too many carbohydrates, being an only child, uh, being the child of uh, alcoholic parents. I mean, there are lots of ways to understand your distress. And for better or for worse, today, being abducted by aliens is a culturally available way to explain some of the symptoms and experiences you've had. And I think we forget that. I think especially scientists forget that. I hear over and over again, oh, these people must be moronic. How do they not know that it's memory distortion combined with sleep paralysis? And don't they know the base rate of depression is very high? But you know what? Most people don't know those things. Most people don't even know what sleep paralysis is. However, most of the country does know about alien abductions. We have been exposed to alien abductions in the books, TVs, and movies since the 1950s. Who hasn't seen, I mean, depending on what age you are, the X, well, I mean, there were the movies in the 50s, then there were the Outer Limits, hugely popular in the 60s. The Outer Limits featured a number of episodes <laughs> where aliens looked like the aliens we know today. There was the theme of reversible amnesia. There was the theme of needles being implanted. There was the theme of hybridization. And there was a the theme of aliens abducting you for purposes. This was in the Outer Limits. Then there was Whitley Stryber's best-selling books in the 80s. There were the uh, X-Files in the 90s. The X-Files are now in Nicaragua. There's only three channels in Nicaragua that work. And on one of them, every night, is the X-Files now. Uh, today, major network, three uh, TV shows about aliens. My daughter, who at two could not tell the difference between a cat and a dog, could identify an alien in South Park episode from across the room. <laughs> we know what aliens look like. We know what they do to us. And it's not that surprising that some of us believe it's possible. I hear over and over again, where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, there must be something. Why is everybody telling the same thing? There must be something fueling these shows. I know it seems unlikely, but it might be possible. And that's what most alien abductees believe. It's probably not the case, but maybe it is the case. What happened to me is exactly what happened to that guy that I saw on TV or in the movie or read about in the book. That does not make you nuts. That makes you very human. Now, where it gets a little weird is for those that actually go on to develop the vivid memories of being abducted. 
So in my research, we found about 10% of believers, so 10% of people who would call in to me and say, I think I've been abducted by aliens, go on to actually develop these vivid, powerful, emotionally distressing memories. And all of them underwent some form of hypnosis or a hypnotic regression technique or a uh, regression technique or I mean it goes by different names but they end up in abduction researchers offices or psychotherapist offices and they are put through various pseudo therapeutic techniques designed to help them retrieve the memories of what they fear happened to them and it is during those techniques that they get these vivid powerful memories of what happened for them they believe what happened because they have the memories and the memories feel very real. But the problem is three decades of memory research shows that hypnosis or any technique like hypnosis that lulls you into a relaxed, suggestible state, one in which your normal reality constraints are relaxed, any technique that lulls you into that state, you run the risk of creating false memories. Why does that happen? Because when you're in that relaxed, suggestible state, you are more prone to get confused between things you imagine and things you really happen to you. Memory researchers call this source monitoring problems. So you have a typical abductee. He thinks maybe he was abducted. He ends up in John Mack's office, who is a Harvard psychiatrist, Pulitzer Prize winning, who inexplicably wrote a book in the 1990s about how he believed these abduction accounts were true. But you know, you've got a believer who goes into the office and John Mack lulls him into his hypnotic state and says, I want you to remember back to that night when you had that episode, when you woke up and you couldn't move. What happened next? You don't remember what happened next? Was there anything in the room with you? Oh, there was a shadow. Did the shadow have a color? Oh, it seemed kind of greenish. Was it holding anything? Oh, maybe it had a needle in the hand. What happened to you next? I mean, this is what happens during these sessions. And you have to take my word for it. You can read, there are millions of transcripts of these hypnosis sessions all over, including in John Mack's book and in Raymond Fowler's book about Betty and Barney Hill. And I just want to stress again, hypnosis might be very good to help you quit smoking or quit drinking or reduce pain accompanied with various disorders, but it's a really bad way to get back your memories. Not only won't it help you, you probably run the risk of creating memories of things that didn't happen to you, things you worried about or were afraid of or imagined. So what's the takeaway? I mean, the takeaway is you have people out there, they're trying to understand their psychologically confusing experiences and their anomalous experiences. For better or for worse, alien abduction is an explanation out there. And uh, some of them end up in therapist's office those are the ones that end up with the vivid memories. But people will say to me, fine, fine, fine. But in today's world where there are so many ways to explain your psychological distress, why would anybody want to believe they were abducted by aliens? Think about it. The abductions are nightmarish. They really are. They're terrifying to listen to. These things come in the night. They take you when you're sleeping. They perform incredibly painful, terrifying medical sexual experiments. Things are like embedded in you and ripped out of you. It's very unpleasant. So many believers say to me, there's no reason to want to believe it happened if it didn't happen. And one of the main takeaways from my book is what scientists and many people are completely tone deaf to is the purposes that these beliefs serve to the believers. They are getting benefits out of their alien abduction beliefs that many people are not paying attention to. There are the obvious benefits, like you have an explanation for why you've never had a healthy relationship and why you keep waking up in the middle of the night with nightmares, okay? So you get an explanation for psychological distress, but you also get something else. At the end of each, at the end of each interview with the subjects, I ask them, if you could do it all over again, would you choose not to have been abducted? I never had one person in five years say, I wish I wasn't abducted. They all said the same thing. It was awful, it was terrible, it was painful. 
but I wouldn't change anything. I'm glad it happened to me. These are the kind of things that came up in the interview. People said things like, obviously the experiences were terrifying, but after I was put back in bed, I felt relieved and glad to have been taken. Again and again, I was overwhelmed by the feeling of transformation. I feel very blessed to have been chosen. Or I have wisdom to share now. I guess the experience broadened my perspective about what reality encompasses. It taught me that we are not here alone, so my priorities in life have changed. Another woman, I'm not so hung up anymore on earthly things. I care more about the spiritual path of mankind. All the hardships and suffering I've had to go through my life, they still hurt when I think about them, but I don't get angry anymore. I accept that this is what I had to go through to get there, to get to this point in my life. The last research subject said to me, she was a 60 year old woman. She kept having me over to the house to do the interviews and she would make these breaded mushrooms. This is the only thing she made, nothing else. So I ended up eating about 10 breaded mushrooms every single time to make her happy. Uh, I can't ever eat them again. But anyway, she said, these beings are like God's angels in a very roundabout way, like messengers. They're here to expand our reality. And out of my aloneness, I have discovered a oneness with the universe. Being abducted for many people is a transformative event. It doesn't just furnish meaning for your psychological distress. It gives you meaning for your entire life. There's something out there. There's something bigger than you are. There's something aware of you. You've been chosen. And this is very, very, very reinforcing to many people. Carl Sagan famously said that people embrace pseudoscience in direct proportion to the degree that they misunderstand science. And I started out this research study thinking that that was the case. And I don't think that anymore. Today, I would have to say I respectfully degree, disagree. Because what the abductees taught me is that we're all going, not all, many of us are going through life looking for meaning, trying on different belief systems for size. And some of them speak to very powerful emotional needs that we have. A lot of us want to feel less alone in the world. Or we want to feel we have special powers or abilities or we have a longing to know that there's something out there bigger than we are, something more important watching over us. And in the search for meaning and these kind of things, many of us are capable of suspending skepticism. Scientists can talk about, oh, it's improbable and it's not the most parsimonious explanation for your problems and there are better explanations out there. And these people, I just don't think they care. By being abducted, they have gotten something truly transformative and meaningful out of their experiences. And once that happens, uh, there's no going back. So we may live in an age of science, of data, facts, experts, but pseudoscientific beliefs are still proliferating. How many of you believe in astrology? Macrobiotic diets. See, I'm afraid to name any of these pseudos. Anybody ever take echinacea for a cold? Doesn't work. <laughs> Nothing. Million dollar industry. Multi-million dollar industry. No evidence it works. In fact, the evidence shows it doesn't work. It doesn't stop us. <laughs> so I think this kind of research shows that for many of us, science just isn't working. It's too cold. We want meaning. We're longing for something bigger than us and spiritual. And that's what I learned. Uh, from this research, and I, I'm glad I did it. Uh, I'd also like to say I studied alien abductees, but I'm not particularly interested in alien abductees. But the reason why I think research like this is important is by picking one particular weird belief and exploring it in detail. We can perhaps shed light on the mechanisms by which people come to believe and endorse other pseudoscientific beliefs. So that's why I think this topic is relevant to a number of different areas as well. And that's all I have to say. Questions? Yes. 
Uh, you've talked about uh, aliens being a little bit more of a hot topic than you expected and, and also uh, sexual abuse. To, to raise yet one more third rail, um, religion, uh, as, as you, you got into this, do um, many of the attributes of people's beliefs and, and why they gravitate toward this and their justifications, is religion in there or would you prefer not to you have No, it is in there. It's in Chapter 6. And I very innocently said that these people are getting out of their alien abduction beliefs what people the world over are getting out of their religious beliefs. And that in a sense, being abducted by aliens might be a baptism into a new religion of the technological age. And that, yeah, I said that. I'm not even, I don't even mention it on radio anymore. Because not only do I piss off the believers, I then piss off the conservatives. So, it, you know, not, I mean, people are enraged that I'm comparing alien abduction beliefs to religion. You know, the truth is, religion, God, there's no scientific evidence to justify belief in God. There never has been. But that doesn't stop billions of us from believing. It's the same thing as the alien abductions. But I don't even go there. <laughs> because that's not a way to just defend crazy guys who think they were abducted. That's a way to, I mean... The UFO community. That's a way to. That's I didn't. That's the way to offend everybody, and including my family. I come from a very Irish Catholic family who loved the book until they got to that last chapter. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Oh, he's got, he did some very re interesting research. Yeah. yeah. Why does he publish everything in that same journal? You realize that's like a third-rate journal, and he does very interesting research, and he consistently publishes everything he's ever done in that one journal. And he doesn't have a lot of scientific credibility because he won't submit it. The problem is a lot of people do very interesting research on this topic, but they do not submit it to the peer review uh, peer review process to get it published in the scientific journals. So they publish it in magazines or journals that don't have peer review, and then it doesn't have any real credibility. Uh, but yeah, he did some he did some interesting stuff. Huh? I don't know what you're talking about. What's the research you're talking about? Oh, Michael Persinger stuff. He worked. He did a lot with studying trance states and hypnosis, and he did a bunch of stuff with anomaly, studying people who had alien abduction experiences and looking at measures of fantasy proneness and things like that. How does he spell his name? P e r s i n g e r. The, the piece that I was interested in was the uh, low frequency electromagnetic, you know, electromagnetic stimulation, and he was like actually evoking these experiences or. And I've seen pointers to this, but I never actually found the actual papers on it. Oh, on Michael Parsons' stuff? It's all in um, perceptual, motor and perceptual experiences. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, the, that's the journal. Uh, no, perceptual and motor experiences. Uh, yeah, he, his research kind of taps. Well, first of all, a lot of people who have temporal lobe seizures, uh, while they're ha including Dostoevsky, by the way, while they're having their seizures are overwhelmed with an intense feeling of spirituality, of religiosity. Many people interpret that as seeing God. So Dostoevsky was sure he was in the presence of God when he was having his seizures. And one hypothesis is that some alien abductees who are having these very uh, extraterrestrial moving experiences might actually be suffering from... Uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. So there seems to be some area in the brain that some people hypothesize is like this religiosity center and if you trigger it you imbue this person with this sense of profound religiosity or spirituality. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting stuff. Yeah. Did you ever interview anybody who wasn't kidnapped by space aliens out of their bed, you know, yeah. they kidnapped anywhere else. Well, here's the thing. Anytime, I'm, 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 no, I'm now prepared to answer all of these questions from people who hate this research, and they say, you're full of crap because I was abducted in my car. Or I was abducted when I was 12 years old. Okay, but here's the thing. What they're talking about is experiences they had that were strange, like driving down the road at night and looking up and seeing a weird light above the car, like a UFO. And they have that experience and they're like, damn, that was a weird light. I wonder what that could be. And then days, months, years, or decades later, they end up in some kind of hypnosis office 
or a therapist's office, and then they're trying to remember back to what happened, and that experience becomes incorporated into the autobiographical memory that then gets developed during the therapy session. Does that make sense? So many people have experienced, like I can't tell you how many people said, well, I was abducted when I was three for the first time. And I say, well, what happened? Oh, I was three, I walked out of the house and there was a weird balloon in the sky. And I said, Daddy, that's a weird balloon. And he said, I don't see anything, honey. That was it. But then she knows now that what was in the balloon is aliens and they came down and took her up and they experimented on her and she met redheaded alien kids that were her friends and blah, blah, blah. But she only knows that 60 years later now that she's put it all together in the therapy session. Also, I want to say something else, which is you can have a sleep paralysis episode when you're not in your bed. I mean, a lot of my research subjects said, don't give me this sleep paralysis crap because I wasn't sleeping. But the thing is, you can fall asleep while you're watching TV one woman said, I wasn't sleeping, I was watching David Letterman. <laughs> Get this. Then this guy says, he's up in New Hampshire, really hostile. He says, oh, it, definitely not sleep paralysis. I wasn't sleeping. What were you doing? I was in my car driving. Oh, what time was it? Two in the morning. What were you doing? I was coming back from a party at some friend's house. So he'd been drinking. It's two in the morning. He's in the car. It's possible he nodded off briefly and had a sleep paralysis experience. So I don't know. Have I ever met somebody who said, at 3 o'clock today, aliens came down. This is what they did to me. When they put me back, I immediately ran and called the police. No. The alien abduction experience gets remembered after the fact. That's why we call it a recovered memory. That's why it fits in the same category of people recovering memories in therapy of things like satanic ritual abuse. And that's why so many people are sure this is actually just an excellent example of a false memory iatrogenically created. Yeah. Do you think if the general public was more aware of the science behind sleep paralysis that there'd be more, less of these reports? And if so, what is the scientific community doing to make the public aware of sleep paralysis? That's excellent. I get so many emails that are nice saying, I had sleep paralysis episodes. I didn't think they were alien abductions, but I didn't know what they were. And thank you for raising attention to it because it was spooky. I think there should be more public awareness about sleep paralysis. Michael Hufford wrote an excellent book called The Terror That Comes in the Night about sleep paralysis and how sleep paralysis has been understood across cultures and across centuries. People have interpreted it as religious visitations, witches, old hags sitting on your neck, erect gorgons in England during the 1700s. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways to interpret this. Today, it's alien abductions, but that will change in another 50 years. Um, so no, right now, I think most people don't know what sleep paralysis is. But you know what, you asked, what did you start out asking? Because there was something else I wanted to say. I, uh, I don't remember now. Scientific responsibility? Oh, yeah. It what can be done to make the public... Oh, I know what I was going to say. Most people who have sleep paralysis experience obviously don't think they were abducted by aliens, right? Only a small percent of those people will endorse that as an explanation. If you got to them right after the sleep paralysis episode while they were looking for an explanation and you said, hey, it's sleep paralysis, then I think they'd be likely to believe it. However, once they get on the belief continuum, once they've adopted that alien abduction belief and it's serving some meaning in their life in terms of explaining psychological distress or whatever, they're very resistant to changing. And in fact, I have an a excerpt in the book. I had a research subject, very nice, we had a wonderful time, and at the end she said to me, how do you explain those weird episodes that happened to me in the night? And I said, well, let me talk to you about sleep paralysis. And then she jumped up and left. And I have the tape recorder still on, and I have a conversation recorded. And, see, I don't know what... I can swear? Yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, she was infuriated. She was saying, who the fuck is this girl uh, coming, telling me about the sleep paralysis shit? I was abducted. I was ripped apart, literally, metaphorically. I come in here to help out, and I get fed sleep paralysis crap. I mean, she was infuriated. And after that, I didn't, I just didn't provide alternative explanations. Unless I was specifically asked, which very rarely did it happen, yeah. Um, your introduction about 
you know, how this turned out to be such, this and your preceding topic turned out to be such political, emotional hot buttons. And the fact that you're from Harvard immediately made me think about Larry Summers. Yeah. And, and I'm a, I've been especially <coughs> sensitive to the fact that what he said and the, what people think he said were very different things. He said he uh, has some, uh, you know, some conjecture that men and women might have different variants in aptitude for science and technology. And it's reported that he said he thinks women might not be as smart as men. I, all right, and, all right. and somebody with your background certainly understands the difference between those. And I just wonder what your take on that was. You know what my take on this? And now I swear, I, this is my own memory distortion. I'm getting this talk now confused with the earlier one. But did I say that I went into Harvard believing that science, oh yeah that you're safe with science, and that as long as you have legitimate scientific techniques and as long as there's data to support what you're saying, you're allowed to say whatever you want. And that is not the case. What, la what happened to Larry Summers is he touched upon an area that people feel very strongly about. And it doesn't matter what he said, because people hear what they want to hear. And, uh, and, and that's very frustrating. Uh, it's just, it, it's just very strange. It's, it's actually very, what's the word? It's depressing. I mean, I'm leaving this area. I just, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to put up with it anymore. I mean, I hate mail and phone calls coming in. I've got three little kids, and I don't want to be called names like a pedophile for my sexual abuse stuff. And yeah, it's, it's just, if you touch certain areas, if you even go 10 feet towards them with a pole, you're going to get electrocuted. Just like, I'm not particularly interested in that because. I worked very closely with Barbara Gross for 10 years before she went to Harvard, okay. and she's been so intimately involved in all this that I've followed it closely. Yeah, where were you working with her? Uh, SRI in California. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Diane. Yeah. Um, this is a Brooklyn Bridge episode of the production. I don't know where it was written up, but it was Mac or somebody else. But this is supposedly. The Secretary General of the UN and his bodyguard are sitting underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. There's somebody else on the bridge. They watch this woman get pulled out of a building by a UFO. And totally independently, this woman ends up in somebody's office doing the I've been abducted thing. Yeah, this is all based on anecdotal evidence. Yes. This is based on what other people say they saw with no objective evidence. Michael Shermer makes a great point in his book. He says, how do we know the moon is round? We don't know the moon is round because somebody who you trust a lot said that they heard somebody that saw something. You know the moon is round because pictures from outer space show that the moon is round. Because the shadow of the moon on the earth is round. Because the ship's mast is the last thing you see as it sails over the horizon. This is the kind of objective evidence you want to support a claim. And something that's frustrating to me with the alien abduction community is I hear all the time, well what about that report of 10 people on the Brooklyn Bridge and then that person was there and somebody else saw her and my aunt, who never lies, told me that that's the case. Or then you get, you know, what about those doctors that are performing surgeries and taking out implants? And there are doctors performing surgery. The problem is what they're taking out, there's no evidence that it's extraterrestrial in nature. You know what I'm saying? So there's no, there's a lot of anecdotal reports, there's a lot of suspicion, rumor, hearsay, but none of that counts as the kind of objective evidence that you would want to support such an unusual claim. You know, they say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You think so? Yep. Well, let's put it another way. If you make an extraordinary claim, the burden of proof is on you to show me that it's in case. It's not on me to disprove it. And I think that's what... It's yeah. Kind of the decent evidence, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that was surprising to me all the time that I get this kind of preposterous evidence and then I'm supposed to disprove the evidence. But again, the burden of proof is on the person making the extraordinary claim to justify or provide evidence for the claim. Yeah. Do you personally believe in God and does your belief or dis or non belief affect your research? I. No, I don't think so. I mean, you can. As long as, it's a good question that people will always say, oh, you shouldn't have your own beliefs going into research. But you have to. I mean, we're all humans. It's impossible. And the reason why you use scientific techniques is because they're standardized and the analyses are standardized and that's how you sort of weed out your own biases, right? I have my own beliefs, which it, 
aliens are not abducting people, and that belief is based on the fact there's no objective evidence that they exist, never mind they're coming into our bedrooms to have sex with us. Um, now, in terms of my belief in God, I literally just don't think about it. I'm, I think the most interesting research question for people going forth is why it is that some people think a lot about the meaning of life and whether there's something bigger out there, why some people seek that meaning and magic and mysticism, and why others of us can just go through our lives agnostic and quite pleased with it. Now, I don't know, I'm not even going to say I'm pleased with it. I just simply don't think about it. I have no need for it yet. I mean, maybe at some point in my life that will change. But right now, it seems to me there are a lot of people who really need and seek meaning, and there are a lot of people out there who don't. Yeah. Um, two questions. Hopefully they're quick. One is, did you ever get to um, some sense of a source trauma in the people that you interviewed? And the other is, I think of somebody like Linda Moulton Howe, who if you read her stuff, you know who she is? Uh -huh. Oh, OK. She's on the radio a lot. She does research on crop circles and um, animal mutilations, and she, it's very interesting stuff. It's very well presented. It comes in this veneer of science. She's a very smart woman, and clearly, she's bought into it in, in some ways. The face on Mar guy, Mars guy. I talked to somebody who knew him for a while, and they just said he's just a liar. Yeah, uh, Richard Hovland. Yeah, so there I were a lot of who knew him. And she just said, look, I work with him. He lies about his credentials. He never did any of the things he said he did. He's out to make a buck. I don't know anything about Linda Moulthouse. I thought maybe a, you know, a scientist of that sort you might have some comments on. But if, if not, I am interested in the first question, which is about whether or not you got to some sense of a source trauma that might be there. I have to just tell you, for people who believe they were abducted by aliens, they are really a heterogeneous group. I mean, it's very hard to assess source trauma. I mean, how do you do that? Psychologists have like 8 million instruments where they try and measure how traumatic your life has been. The problem is we all differ in what we classify as a trauma. I mean, some people go through car accidents and end up with, you know, paralysis in one leg, and it's not a big deal to them. It sucks, but it wasn't that bad. Other people, their cat dies, and that was traumatic enough to send them into a tailspin for 10 years. So the problem is that whole question, it's interesting, I guess, theoretically, but it's very hard, you know, what is source trauma as a construct? How do you measure it? Um, no. But, I mean, what, it, what I did notice with many of the subjects is that they did have experiences that were disturbing to them that they were trying to understand. But I don't know if I would classify them as a source trauma. I don't even know how you would measure it. I think it's interesting, though. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, in cases where people have, and I hope I get it right, frontal lobe seizures. Yeah, temporal lobe. Temporal lobe. And they, um, then they have those um, extreme, this extreme sense of spirituality yes. or, or seeing God or seeing Or aliens. intense sexual experiences. In fact, there was one woman who refused to go on medication because she preferred her incredible 15 times a day orgasmic experiences, even though she ended up in a car accident because of it. Anyway. No, I don't know if I can just All right. So can just head off right there. Um, Why do this is you know, hypothesized? Why do you think that is the case? Why do you think that this thing creates this sort of sensation? What what is the purpose, meaning whatever, of, of this thing? How come? I think it's an area in the brain that when you trigger it, it releases all some kind of intense, warm, positive feeling, and that we just do our best to interpret it, and it's a feeling that we feel is religious. But I think it's very, un I mean, I think it's just very mechanistic. I mean, I think it's just an area. You could trigger a different area in the brain and you would hear voices. Or I could trigger a different area and you would see the color red. Right. Or I could trigger a different area and you might have a bizarre memory of something. You know, so I, I think it's just where the source of the seizure is. And what's happening is it's releasing this intense feeling. Uh, that once you have that feeling, like, for example, Dostoevsky, his doctor said to him, you're sick. This is epilepsy. And Dostoevsky was brilliant, and he knew he had a medical condition. So he was able to be cognitively aware he had a medical condition, but he still never refuted. He never changed his belief that while it was happening, he was in the presence of God. 
it's a thing. It's very interesting. There's that that dichotomy. Like on the one hand, yeah, yeah, it's medical. But on the other hand, he said, I don't care if it's medical in nature. I'll tell you when it was happening. I was in the presence of God, and I wouldn't change that. And the takeaway for me is that these people have their experiences. They're very unique and personal. I don't have any access to that data. I don't know what that felt like for that person. It was intensely personal, and that is their best way to explain it. And when you have these deeply moving emotional experiences, they're immune to science or reason or probability or parsimony. Do you want to stop? Yeah.